Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Dr. Mike Detola is our speaker tonight, and he'll be sharing his go-to strategies for optimal restoration workflow. If you've attended a previous webinar with us, you may have noticed that our in-webinar console has changed. I'd like to highlight some features that will enhance your viewing experience. If anyone has a question, please type it into the box labeled have a question. And to talk with other attendees, navigate to your control panel at the bottom of your screen and click the chat icon. Before we begin, I do want to note that Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for this webinar. Dr. Detola, over to you. Well, thank you for that generous introduction. I'm really excited to be here as part of the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar, We're averaging three or four a week on every topic in the dental universe. So you, you definitely wanna make sure that you get on board and check some of these out because there's some great information and some great presenters putting out information. Well, as you can see today, what we're talking about is mastering crown preps and impression techniques. And so mastering, I just, I just wanna spend a second kind of talking about mastership and what I mean by that and what it maybe means to try to master these things. And I've always felt that you can take all dentists and if you put it on a graph with four quadrants and you look at prep speed from slow to fast and prep quality from low to high, that when we get out of dental school, we all start off here in this lower left-hand corner. We're apprentices. We're not very fast and the quality is not as good as it's going to be 10 years from now, maybe five years from now, or based on when we graduate, because we're just gonna do more and more of these. And I think a lot of times that as dentists with our hand-eye stuff that we do, we're a little bit like athletes and we should get better at things as we do them more repetitively. And it is called practice after all, and we should be getting better. So there's a lot of dentists who find their way up to that upper left-hand quadrant, you know, what I might call a cutter, somebody whose prep speed has gone up where they can prep way more units in a shorter amount of time than they could when they got out of school. But the quality has never really gotten um, any better. And the patients really don't know this. Sometimes the staff doesn't even know it. Really, the dental laboratory is the only one who knows it. They get to see the preps and impressions and know exactly what's going on. Then we have some dentists who shift to the lower right-hand corner where their speed never really increases. Maybe they still book 90 minutes, for example, for a single unit crown prep, but the quality is very, very high. And these are picture perfect preps that you see sometimes in dental journals where you're like, wow, I wonder how long that took to do. And it probably took a long time to do because you probably had to polish the prep at the end of it to make it look that good. I would call this group of dentists, the artists, the ones whose quality is very high, but they don't have um, a sense of urgency about trying to, to finish the prep uh, quicker than they did, say, five years ago. And, and there's not to say there's anything wrong with that. It's just that patients don't necessarily love the experience of having their tooth prep. And I think patients would pay more to get the same crown prep result if you could do it in 10 minutes than if it took you 40 minutes. It's kind of an inverse relationship to like a massage, for example, where the more you pay, the longer it goes. I think patients would pay more to have a root canal or a crown take a shorter amount of time. And so I where I think we should all be striving for is that upper right-hand corner, that master corner where we've been able to not only increase our quality, but increase our speed and our efficiency in being able to do this. And so that's kind of what I'm gonna focus on today is how we might be able to move to that upper right-hand quadrant. Part of it is just, repetition, but part of it's being smart about the materials, the techniques that we use to accomplish this, because there are ways of, of doing things better, most likely than how we were taught in dental school. So regardless of where we are on this, we should find ourselves kind of heading towards that upper right hand quadrant and putting out as much quality uh, as we can in the most efficient way possible. And I'm not talking about doing 90 second crown preps or anything like that. We're not trying to set a speed record here. That's not what this is about. Quality always has to go hand in hand with speed anytime we're trying to increase it. Because having practiced inside of the world's largest dental lab for 15 years, we see a lot of preps that come in and look like this. I don't even know if that was made with the burr. Look at the top of that. It looks like it was maybe made with a the chisel. There was actually more preparation done to the soft tissue here than there was to the hard tissue. And um, you look at this and it's a, it's a little bit heartbreaking sometimes to see something like that. And we've had a good run in dentistry, I'm just going to show you a very quick video to show you what the digital design of dental restorations looks like. So here you can see a technician who's designing a crown. And then all of a sudden, she's able to take this crown and go into this 
2D slice look, this cross section. You can see this blue circle here where it's bisecting the prep tooth and the opposing tooth. And watch what she's gonna do here. She's gonna click on the opposing tooth and she's gonna click on the prep tooth and it says 0 0.85 millimeters. So in two seconds, she clicked on the prep and the opposing tooth and found out how much reduction there was to the hundredth of a millimeter. And if this was a lithium disilicate crown, for example, that needs a minimum material thickness of one millimeter. So this would be underprepared and you would either have to reprep the tooth or switch over to solid zirconia. My point is that unlike 20 years ago, when technicians did not have this technology, it was a more of a guessing thing where they would look at it and go, ah, it doesn't look like you prepped enough. And you, we'd say, oh, I was there. I'm pretty sure I prepped enough. They can now in two clicks of a mouse tell you in the hundreds of a millimeter how much you reduce. And they'll be very happy to send you a screenshot if you don't believe them. So what I'm saying is it's time to step our game up as dentists. It's, you know, technicians are checking up on our homework. They're seeing exactly how much we reduced. There's no more he said, she said argument when it comes down to how much we reduce. So I want you to know if you haven't seen it before, if you're not doing chair side CAD cap, that this is what your technicians are looking at. This is the degree of precision they have. You can see how blown up even the margin and everything else is. And so we're going to talk about magnification as well, because it's so important. But this is how the lab is seeing our preps now, much bigger than we get to see it in the office and much more easier, unless you're doing intraoral scanning where you can click and see exactly how much you reduced. But if you're not, I'm gonna show you a couple different ways to make sure that you reduce enough because your technician's absolutely going to know if you reduced enough or not. There's not an argument to be had anymore. Here's a piece of yarn uh, at a typical working distance of 16 inches to the naked eye. And if we move over one circle, you can see that we have two and a half X magnification. Obviously we're seeing much more detail than we are in um, image A. Image C is 4.5 X and image D is 5.5 X where we can see all kinds of detail and strands that simply weren't visible over on the left. I don't, I don't think any dentist is allowed to graduate from dental school these days without loops, but I'm old enough where we did not have loops and it seems unthinkable that we used to prep teeth that way. Whatever loops you get, even this magnification on the right, that 5.5, that's still not as much as your laboratory is going to be able to magnify it when they get it in the digital system. And that's one of the reasons why having an intraolar scanner is really important is you can start to blow things up like this. You can check reduction. There's, if you ask me what is the one fastest way to become a better dentist clinically, it's bringing digital technology into your practice. Start by dipping your toe into the water with an intraoral scanner. And your dentistry will absolutely get better if you want it to be. It will give you huge leaps in growth compared to just trying to learn from trial and error and regular experience. The digital experience uh, is an incredible learning experience. And uh, if you just embrace that initial small learning curve, uh, you'll be very happy you did it and you will become a better dentist. Another thing that I need to be able to master uh, great preparations is an electric hand piece. And I've been using the Cavo Electromatic hand pieces for the last 20, probably four years. Obviously, there's other manufacturers that make electric hand pieces too, but I have a lot of confidence in Cabo as a hand piece company and had a lot of success using these hand pieces. And there's a lot of great things about electric hand pieces. And I'm going to mention a few of them to you because I initially bought them thinking that I was going to prep faster and that hasn't happened at all. I don't think it's made me slower. Maybe it takes an extra two minutes with an electric hand piece because I'm able to do things like turn the water off at the end and turn the speed all the way down as low it will go and finish the margin with a fine grit diamond. It's very concentric. It's got torque for as long as, the, as long as you need and as much as you need regardless of the speed. And if you've had the experience of cutting off a solid zirconia crown, you'll know how hellish that can be. And that is when you really want to have a high torque hand piece like a, a Cabo um, electromatic hand piece. And so when I originally got electric hand pieces over 20 years ago, solid zirconia didn't exist. It wasn't even a thing, but now it's become a great reason to have an electric hand piece. There's prep modes you can see. And again, this you can see here, it indicates the motor's running at 1000 RPM. So the, the motor at the top end uh, is running at 40,000 RPMs. I turn it all the way down to 1000 RPMs so that the bird's going much slower than it usually would. 
and I can turn the water off because I'm not generating a lot of frictional heat. And it allows me to see as I smooth off the margin because I know my lab's going to blow it up 20 times bigger than I can see it in the mouth. If you still do a lot of endo, it's got pre-programmed endo modes that you can do with it as well. And so that makes it very convenient to become your endo handpiece too. So should your next handpiece that you purchase be electric? I just want to share some numbers from Gordon Christensen and some research that he did with his subscribers with U.S. Dennis um, at CR. And they asked him, do you use electric hand pieces? 51% of dentists said yes, they do use electrics. 16% of them use electric hand pieces exclusively. I would put myself in that category, except I still own an air turbine or two for just the smallest of mouths trying to get into the back. I will still go to an air turbine because it does have a smaller head than the smallest electric hand piece. But otherwise, I'm all electric all the time. Again, the advantage is high power and torque, minimum stalling or slowing, if any. Very, very smooth cutting, very concentric. They're quieter. As soon as you turn it down to about 15,000 RPMs for those patients who are phobic and afraid, or if you just, I hate the high pitch whine of an air rotor and being able to turn it down and cut a little slower, but not have that noise, I think is absolutely fantastic. So they're definitely quieter. And I love the precise speed control. I'll probably change speeds five or six times during a prep, depending on what I'm trying to accomplish. If I'm doing just bulk reduction on the cluval surface, we're at full speed. But as I start to dial in things on the mesial and distal margins, I will turn it down, which requires me to use more force, you know, holding it against the tooth. It won't stall out, but I'm in more contact with the tooth with a larger burr, taking more definitive strokes than I am when the speed is a lot higher. Multiple attachments. Once you have the electric hand piece motor, you can put all kinds of attachments on the end of it. The disadvantages, well, they're more expensive, uh, but a lot of great technology is. So I guess that's a disadvantage. Um, I mean, they are more expensive. They are larger and they do weigh a little bit more. They've gotten smaller over time. When you see some of the electric handpiece motors, if you haven't looked at them for 10 years, you'll be surprised. And there were concerns about them overheating in the past. Pretty much every brand will now shut itself off if it starts to get um, too hot uh, because of the control board will read the temperature on the inside of the handpiece. Um, I have never had to set one down because it got too hot. But then again, we do, we're very good about maintaining them and sending them in for servicing when they need it. Here's just an example of some attachments, high speed contra angle, it's a, a one to five. So again, if you're running the motor at a thousand RPMs, the burr is actually turning at 5,000 RPMs in this case. So at 40,000 RPMs, the burr is turning at 200,000 RPMs. Next to that is a one to one. So if the motor's turning 1,000 RPMs, that's what the burr is turning. Then you can see a straight uh, nose cone with a one to one. A uh, four to one endo handpiece, four to one profi angle going even slower, and then an impact drill, 20 to one, all fitting on the same electric motor. So tons of versatility here. And besides cutting off zirconia crowns, another great thing about electric handpieces is polishing crowns intraorally. If you have to make an occlusal adjustment after you cement it, uh, a lab technician would never use anything but an electric handpiece to polish your restoration because of all the torque. And that's what I feel we should be using in the mouth as well. Again, you can see all of them are priced roughly the same. So don't let price be the deciding factor in, in which brand you choose when you decide to go forward with an electric handpiece. Just pick the handpiece company that, uh, that you trust the most and uh, go with them. These are all relatively the same price. You can see over on the far right, we've got a um, high-speed handpiece, an air turbine. And then the other ones from one to eight are electric handpieces. So still a little bit taller. You know, when you look at it from where the burr goes in to the turbine up to the back, head, the highest part of the handpiece. So for patients, pedo patients, patients who just can't open very wide or very tight spaces like on tooth number 15, I do still have an air rotor that I can pull out, but otherwise I'm going all electric all the time. Now, in terms of mastering the preparation technique, um, when I started practicing inside that dental laboratory, I, I found out really quickly that I had been a chronic under preparer. And it's the number one issue that you'll hear from dental technicians nationwide when you ask them about dentists is inadequate reduction. Nobody ever complains about overzealous uh, reduction. It just, it doesn't happen. You know, we're, we're trying to be conservative by nature as dentists. And so we have a tendency to underreduce. We also tend to be a little tooth seat of the pantsage, like, like we're an artist and we're going to go in and, and carve this, you know, prep out of this tooth and, and not be scientific enough or rigorous enough to kind of check how much we've reduced. And so that's kind of part of it too. 
is that we've been a little lazy on really nailing down how much we've reduced. We've eyeballed it a little too much, which I guess was fine when technicians weren't able you know, to take a polyvinyl impression, pour it in stone, scan it on a benchtop scanner, make two mouse clicks and see exactly how much we've reduced. We got to start checking before we send those cases out now. So I came up with this technique, the reverse preparation technique, in order to make the technicians that I was working on happy and be okay with my preps because I had a really hard time not under prepping. So it's based on these burrs, these depth control burrs. It's based on a couple different burrs, but these are the depth cutters that I use. They're from Kerr Rotary and, and Henry Schein carries these. They're called MADC burrs. There's four of them. There's a 0 0.6 millimeter depth cutter that has one ring on it a one millimeter depth cutter that has two rings, a 1.5 millimeter that has three rings, and a two millimeter depth cutter that has four rings. If you've been you know, taking a webinar or class lately on minimum material thicknesses, these numbers might sound familiar to you. 0 0.6 is the minimum material thickness for a three Y full strength solid zirconia crown. Uh, one millimeter is an ideal thickness for a solid zirconia crown, but one millimeter is also the minimum material thickness for lithium disilicate crowns. 1.5 millimeters is more of an ideal thickness for lithium disilicate. It's also a great thickness for a solid zirconia crown. Both those materials, like most dental materials, the thicker they get, the stronger they get. Porcelain, you know, feldspathic porcelain, like on old PFMs, isn't that way because it's got so much glass in it. But lithium disilicate and solid zirconia, the thicker they get, the stronger they get. And the last burr is the two millimeter depth cutter. That was for bilayered restorations like porcelain fused in metal, porcelain fused to zirconia. So if you're still using those materials, you will have a use for that two millimeter reduction. But it's a far cry, two millimeters from the 0 0.6 that we can do um, uh, with a solid zirconia crown on a second molar, for example. Now, just because we can do 0 0.6 millimeters, doesn't mean that we should do 0 0.6 millimeters. I'm much more comfortable with the solid zirconia crown at one millimeter, especially if you have to make any occlusal adjustments. So there's those burrs lined up from left to right, one, two, three, and four rings on those. I honestly don't care what you use to make depth cuts, but it should be something that has a shoulder on it like these burrs do. So in other words, I was taught in school to do depth cuts with the 330 burr, but when a 330 burr goes in, there's nothing to stop it. It's easy to go too shallow and it's easy to go too deep. And again, it's forcing you to kind of eyeball your depth cut. And so if a, any depth cutter that has a shoulder, it's kind of a self-limiting depth cutter where you can keep pushing it, but it's not going any deeper than one millimeter, for example, if you keep pushing it, because the, un, the portion of the burr that doesn't have any particles on it is just spinning against the tooth. So I like depth cutters where you can push it down until it won't go any farther and you know you've got an exact depth cut and you didn't have to eyeball it at all. Now, as I mentioned, for three Y solid zirconia or full strength solid zirconia brands like Bruxer and things like that, the minimum occlusal reduction is 0 0.6 millimeters. The only practical way to do this is with a 0 0.6 millimeter uh, depth cutting burr. You can't close one eye and pull the cheek back and eyeball 0 0.6 millimeters. It's, it's just not gonna happen. It's magical thinking. So that burr is one stripe, but again, if your lab is sending you a crown that's 0 0.6 millimeters thick, there should be a sticker on the box letting you know that this crown is at minimum material thickness. Ask your lab to send a note to let you know that because if you still need to adjust the bite on that, you're going to have to adjust the opposing tooth. Because as strong as solid zirconia is, once it drops below six tenths of a millimeter in thickness, it will break in the mouth. So the ideal reduction, as I said, is one millimeter. That burr has two stripes on it. If you've ever seen that hammer test that I did with that zirconia crown where I hit it once and pounded it into a piece of plywood, that was at 1.5 millimeters thick. So at 0 0.6 millimeters, when you hit a zirconia crown on a piece of plywood with a sledgehammer, it breaks into pieces. Even at one millimeter, it'll usually break into two, sometimes three pieces. It takes 1.5 millimeters where you can hit that, that crown into the wood and it doesn't break. So again, thicker is better, but we like this material because we can go thinner, but we can't go as thin with solid zirconia as we do with cast gold, uh, for example. So even though we can go thin, that doesn't mean we should go thin. You know, the thicker we go within reason, the more we can, are able to do like an occlusal adjustment there, and we don't have to worry about the crown breaking after the occlusal adjustment. Lithium disilicate materials. 
The minimum occlusal reduction is one millimeter. Again, you cannot adjust a one millimeter lithium disilica crown in the mouth. It'll get too thin and violate that minimum material thickness. Again, you should ask your lab to send you a note anytime they're making a lithium disilica crown for you at one millimeter so you know to adjust the opposing tooth. I mean, yeah, you could have prepped more. Maybe they'll give you a reduction coping uh, for that crown, then you won't have to adjust the opposing. But I, when you look at how crowns handle us adjusting and polishing in the mouth, opposing teeth, you know, God's teeth, natural teeth, they actually handle it better than the materials we work on. And so while we don't like to go in and have to adjust opposing cusps, those natural teeth really actually handle that better, being adjusted with a fine grit diamond and then polished than most of our man-made materials do when it comes down to putting a, a nice high shine back onto the tooth structure itself. So again, the ideal reduction for lithium disilicates 1.5 millimeters. It's even stronger at two millimeters. At two millimeters on an anterior crown, it allows your technician to cut back and layer it if you want them to. Okay, so this, pre this te prep technique that I mentioned, the reverse prep technique, the reason I call it that is because we prep the gingival margin first. Well, almost first, it's like the second or third step, but it's not at the end like I was taught. In dental school, I was taught prep the whole tooth and at the very end, prep the margin. I found that to be the most difficult way to prep teeth. And I think it's great for the top 10% of the class who can handle it. But for the rest of us, and I was not in the top, I was in the top 10% of the class the first year, then when we had to go downstairs and start working with our hands, that quickly slid because I learned very quickly that I have a very average set of hands. In fact, if I'm being perfectly honest, I probably have a below average set of hands. And it took a lot of time and effort and techniques like this reverse prep technique to be able to get above average results with a below average set of hands. It, it, it doesn't just happen. And, and this is the result of that. It took six years for me to kind of put all the pieces of this technique together to get to a spot where I can now go into a dental school and show this technique to third year students is typically who I'm asked to talk to. And they'll have a type of knot and they'll prep um, an anterior tooth and a posterior tooth using this technique for the first time. And the preps look great. So there's not a lot of skill required per se when you're using this technique because it does a lot, takes a lot of the uh, artistic necessity out of the prep technique. So when we're using these depth cutters, we always wanna have them perpendicular. Uh, to the surface of the tooth that we're cutting into. So as you can see, the head of the hand piece is tilted over just a little bit because we're on a slanted portion. You can also go to the cusp tip and go straight down um, if you want, or you can you can tell I put a groove in the, I put a depth cut in the central groove and then one for the buckle and one for the lingual. And then as you'll see, we put them on the axial surfaces as well. And again, if we're doing solid zirconia, I'm gonna use a one millimeter depth cut. And by prepping the two till I can't see the depth cuts anymore, the holes that I put, I know that I've got at least a millimeter of reduction, probably a couple tenths more by the time I smooth everything up. This is the reverse preparation uh, prep kit from Kerr Rotary. This is available through Henry Schein um, as well. And it's kind of, it's a logic set that goes from left to right is kind of the order that I use the burrs in. And you're gonna see that in more detail right now. So this is the bird kit, and I want to point out a couple of unique burrs to you. Well, here's a very common bird, just to start off with. This is a, a 57 burr. We're just going to use this to break the contacts. Once we break the contacts, we're going to put a retraction cord in place, as you'll see. And then we're going to prep the margins, and we're going to use this burr that you probably haven't seen before. This is an 801021. You can see the numbers right up here. 801 is the shape of the burr. The first three numbers are the shape of the burr, and that's a perfectly round diamond, and 021 is the diameter of the burr at the widest point. So that's 2.1 millimeters wide across the widest point of the burr. Shine also sells this burr in an 018 width, an 016, an 014, an 012. So this is just gonna determine how deep of a chamfer margin you have. How deep do you need? Well, it's your call, really. I mean, you can do a pretty shallow one with solid zirconia, but you want a deeper chamfer if you're doing lithium disilicate. And definitely deeper if you're doing a bilayered restoration like porcelain fused to metal. That's where you want to use the 021. You could use the 021 for any of them. You know, I had an instructor in dental school who said, give me a margin that's like a running track. I want to be able to run around the tooth without slipping off the side. And that's kind of always been my philosophy. But if I'm using, if I'm doing solid zirconia, it's probably going to be an 016, an 801016 instead of an 801021. So the beauty of this, um, 
uh, round burr is that it's a, also kind of a self-limiting depth cut. And when we use it to prepare the margins very early on, um, the part of the shank that hits the tooth is gonna keep it from seeding too deeply. And as a result of that, it's gonna make a perfect kind of half circle around the margin of the tooth. On the facial and the lingual, it typically won't fit mesial and distally or on uh, anterior teeth, sometimes on posterior teeth, but that's okay. We just want the facial and the lingual to connect to that depth cut that we made with that 57 burr. Again, here are some of those depth cutters. Here's that 0 0.6 millimeter depth cutter. I mean, look at that. There's like 13 diamond particles on the tip of that. It's barely anything. It's hard for me to believe sometimes that we can make a tooth colored crown out of solid zirconia that's only that thick. Now keep in mind, if you do a solid zirconia crown that's only six tenths of a millimeter thick, it's not really going to look like a crown. It's gonna look more like a tooth colored thimble because you haven't given the technician any room to create anatomy. So this isn't, let's see the least amount we can prepare every time. If you want it to look like a crown, you've got to give your technician a little more room than that. And that's why we're not always shooting for six tenths of a millimeter and sometimes shooting for 1.5 millimeters if the tooth allows it. Because not only do we get a better looking crown, but we get a crown where in case we have to make an occlusal adjustment or two, we're not going to perf that crown. But it's always amazing to me how conservative that 0 0.6 millimeter is. And here's the 1.5 millimeter. I think you get the idea. There's the two millimeter. And again, when we put that in and seat it all the way, it hits that shoulder that's on that burr and it can't go any deeper. And it's a great way uh, to be able to make sure that our depth cuts are accurate. This is one of my favorite burrs in the world. This is an 856025. Big, nice, fat burr that does a great job of doing most of the bulk reduction that we're going to do on the tooth. Again, 856 is the shape of this burr. 025 is the width of the burr at the widest part. And so if you're just preparing one anterior crown, for example, this burr is too big to actually fit in between the teeth. In fact, that's one of the reasons that you see kind of those TP preps sometimes on anterior teeth. That's from a dentist who's tried to take too big of a burr in approximately. You have to lean it way over so you don't hit the adjacent tooth. And when you do that, you end up over prepping the incisal half of the tooth that you're actually prepping. But I love this for lots of surface area, supports its weight really well on the tooth, especially when you're going from, let's say, buildup material to natural tooth structure. When you're going from tooth to buildup, when you have a thinner burr on there, it has a tendency to dive into that buildup material. But this supports its own weight because of how broad the surface is, so it doesn't want to dive into the tooth because it's less like a scalpel. It's big and and round and wide. And so interproximally, sometimes we have to use this little brother, the 856016, the one you can see on the left. So same shape of burr, it's an 856 shape, but its widest point is 1.6 millimeters instead of 2.5 millimeters. And you can see how the burr on the left, if you're just prepping, let's say tooth number eight, for example, and I'll show you an anterior prep in a minute, this is the bird that's going to be able to fit in between there. And then once you start doing that interproximal axial reduction on the tooth you're preparing, then the 856025 burr will fit in there later. But we need to clear some space with it with the 016. Here's our football burr. This is 379023. Um, the only thing I'd say about this as a football burr is that it's not pointy. And so it does really well on the lingual of anterior teeth. You can also use it on posterior teeth for the occlusal reduction. And then that very last burr I use at the end to smooth everything off, to get all the chips out of the margin. Because remember my 856.02 fiber that you saw there was a super coarse burr, huge diamond particles on it, so that we're doing our occlusal and axial reduction really quickly. That's where we're making up a lot of time in this technique because we see our depth cuts and we just prep until the depth cuts are gone and then we know we're done. It's almost like having GPS for your prep it's telling you when you're done instead of just going around and around in circles and going, I wonder if I'm done. But because of the big diamond particles, it leaves chips out of the margin that you can't see with the naked eye. You can't even see it with your loops. Your technician can see it when they blow it up 20 times. So this is the burr we end with. This is an 856025, same size and shape of burr, but this is the fine grit diamond. So you can tell this has uh, 40 micron diamond particles here. Look how smooth that looks. And it's Industry-wide, it's that red stripe burr that's got these fine diamond particles on it. This is where we're going to turn the, the handpiece motor down to 1,000 RPMs. We're going to turn the water off because we're not creating enough heat where we need to have the water on. 
And we're just going to take in short, smooth strokes. You can have your assistant blow in air if you want on it, but I usually don't because this is the one time you can really see what you're doing at the margin with the water up. And the, I learned this from Bill Strupp, and it's the big game changer to turn the water off at the end and be able to smooth off those margins. You don't realize you know, how obscuring the water is until you try to turn it off. And that's impossible to do with an air rotor. If you turn the water off and try to feather the handpiece, you're not going to have enough torque. It's going to stall out. This is really a technique that can only be done with an electric handpiece where you turn the speed all the way down, have enough torque to keep prepping, and the water can be off so you can totally see what you're doing. It just leaves a perfect little line of tooth dust right where you're prepping, and it's a great way to be able to dial this in. So that's the 856.025 Fur. And you can just see when they're next to each other how rough and aggressive, and this would be removing a bulk amount of tissue, a bulk amount of tooth structure versus our red stripe burr. All right, so that's pretty much it. So let's go in and do this on a tooth. So we're gonna break the contacts first as step one. Whether this is a 56 or a 57 burr, it really doesn't matter. Just, just break the contacts. And the next thing we're gonna do is put some retraction cord in place. And uh, Pascal makes a wonderful assortment of packing cords. And whether you wanna use braided or knitted, this is a, double, a size double zero cord. So this is always gonna be the first cord that goes in is this size double zero cord, super easy to pack into place. I like a non-serrated cord packer because it seems not to grab onto it um, so much. Pascal also makes you know hemostatic gel you can put on first to help the cord slide in under the tissue. But I'm always gonna start, as soon as I break the contacts with this double zero cord, it's gonna retract the tissue about a half millimeter apically. Um, that's all it's gonna do is retract the tissue vertically, but that's where I'm gonna be able to prep my margin right at that new margin of the gingiva. And here it goes, we're gonna prep it right here. So again, just to make this point, we've broken the contacts, we put a double zero cord in, and now we're prepping the margins of the crown, which is why it's reversed, because we're usually prepping it at the end. So watch with this round burr. This burr gets more stable as it gets farther into the tooth. And uh, you know, with my below average set of hands, I should have hit the uh, gingiva several times with this burr over the year, but I don't because as it's at half circle seats itself into the tooth, it's easier to control and less likely to slide around. And that's why it's a very stable burr to use. So you're just putting this margin right at the gingival margin, knowing that when that double zero cord comes out, that tissue is gonna rebound. So we're prepping a margin here that's eventually gonna be half a millimeter subgingival, but we're never gonna take a burr subgingively because we don't want to damage the tissue. And that's it, there's my facial margin prepped in 10 or 12, Real-time seconds, maybe 10 or 15 seconds. I didn't actually count as I was doing that. But you can we've got a perfect half circle now. So that round burr, half of it goes in and leaves a half circle as our margin. When we do our axial reduction and we get rid of that top half, we're going to have a quarter circle. A quarter circle is what a chamfer is. And you can see that half circle that we have going all the way around. here. You see connect to the 56 burr. You can see it's a little rough right where those two come together and that's going to get smoothed out obviously but you can tell that we've got the beginning of our margin here you know we're going to do this little smoothing at the end of it as we connect all of these things together but this is the easiest margin you will ever prep i remember the first time i got this idea to use the round burr for a margin from an old 1940s prosthodontic textbook that i bought on ebay i buy old dental stuff on ebay and i was just looking through and it was back in the belt driven handpiece and steel burrs and this prosthodontist was doing this. I thought, I'd never tried that. I want to try that with the round burr. And I remember the first time I prepped the tooth with it. And I looked down. Now, if you use that round burr at the end, it doesn't work. If you prep the whole tooth like we taught in dental school and then try to use the round burr, it, it doesn't work. It needs to have unprepared tooth structure there for the shank of the burr to hit again so that you don't go too deep and you just do a half circle in the tooth. And the first time I prepped the tooth like that and then prepped the rest of it, I looked down with the mirror and I couldn't believe, I was like, that, that is literally the best margin I've ever prepped. Totally uniform on the facial and lingual, looks great on the mesial and distal, all connected, all very visible to the laboratory technician. And it was one of the easiest margins I had ever prepped. It was an absolute kind of revolutionary, mind-blowing game changer for me that first day. I used that burn. I want you to experience this. Um, once uh, with that burr and, and see what it's like to prep this way. But you have to do it at the beginning of the procedure like I do here. If you try to do it at the end, it's just too easy to over prep. And again, that was the, the 021, the 801-021 burr. 
you know, today I could do this with an 01 six burr if we were using translucent zirconia. Um, it's just up to you. And so it's a, whatever material you want to choose, that's where you decide how conservative you're going to be. You can't decide, oh, I'm going to use lithium disilicate, but I only want to prep eight tenths of a millimeter. That's not conservatism. Conservatism comes in treatment planning. When you pick what material you're going to use, cast gold, solids are going to lithium disilicate, bilayered material. That's where you decide how conservative you're going to be. Once you decide what material you're going to use, there's definite rules for how much you have to reduce. Conservatism does not come in the prepping stage. It comes in the planning stage. So you can see we've got our margin prep there. And again, if we looked at it from the side, we would see that half circle that's prepped in there. Now we're going to do some incised alleged depth cuts. Again, this just depends on what material we're we're using here. I was using a universal technique here. So this is a two millimeter depth cut. This is back when we used to cut back and layer lithium disilicate materials like that. It's a lot of dentists still do, but a lot have gone to monolithic restorations in the anterior that are just stained and glazed. So we've got our depth cuts there on the incisal edge, for example. And now all we need is an axial depth cut. And so the camera's coming from the side just so you can see this. And again, it's this depth cut, the depth of it is just based on what material you're going to use. And so here again, I'm taking this and I'm just putting it against the facial surface of the tooth. And here you can really see that I just push it and the depth cut gets done and boom, it won't go any deeper. And there we go. And now we know exactly how deep we need to go. We need to prep till we don't see that circle anymore. And that's basically how it is. So we've got everything in place here that now we can go a lot faster. So we, we slowed down a little bit in the beginning, put some depth cuts in. Now we can take our 856 025 and just go in there and fly and get the rest of this two structure up. We know we've already prepped the depth that we need in our gingival third, you know, so that we're going to have a natural looking margin, good emergence profile. So we're really just prepping the axial surface here to get rid of everything down to our depth cut. We've already kind of prepped a little bit of the incisal edge with those depth cuts. So we're going back and forth and just blending those together too. And here we are going in between the teeth with an A56016 burr. So we don't hit this adjacent crown or this adjacent natural tooth. And we're holding the burr vertical because it's got the taper built into it that we need. As we go around, you can see little hints of the uh, double zebra cord that's in that sulcus. And so we're just doing our axial reduction on the mesial and the distal here. And later on, we'll be able to fit the 856025 burr in here. And you can see it's in there right now. I'm using it with the water off here just to kind of rough out um, the rest of this. This is an endodontically treated tooth and it's kind of dark. So I am going to want to use a little more thickness here than I usually would to block that out for my restorative material. Here's the 379023 being used on the lingual surface. And again, it doesn't have a point on it so that it doesn't get hung up in the cingulum or leave too many scratches. And then we're going to place our top cord. Anywhere where it can handle a top cord, we're going to place a size two cord on top of our double zero cord. And so you can see right here, that's being packed on top of this. You can't do this on maxillary bicuspids. You really can't do this on lower anteriors, but on just about all molars and um, central and lateral incisors, a hollow number two cord like this, this has an epi thread in it as well. Pascal makes some amazing um, uh, products with epi, not only their cord, but their pellets that we'll see a little bit later. So this top cord, this two cord is going to go on top. This is what's going to give us a lateral retraction of the tissue away from the tooth. And that's why this is the gold standard. We'll cut that loose end. And now I'm going to finish the gingival margin with my 856025 with the water turned off at 1,000 RPMs, just smoothing all the little chips that I know are on that margin, but I can't see, but my lab will be able to see when they blow it up. And here's our prep all finished with the two cords sitting in place. We're gonna moisten an anatomical copper cap here in just a second and have the patient bite down on it. This is gonna help give us hemostasis. And at the same time, if this was a vital tooth, it's not, but it would keep it nice and moist. And it keeps the cord in place and with the patient from playing with the uh, prep with their tongue. And you'll see when the patient bites down and, and shine sells these copper caps as well. Look at the hemostasis up here on this side compared to over on that side. So that's part of our three-part approach to not having any bleeding when we take this impression. You know, we've got our double zero cord in so that we don't touch the gingiva with a burr. We've got a top cord that has epi in it. And now we've used a compression cap on top of it. And just look at this, look how wide open that sulcus is. You can see that I'm going clockwise around the tooth with the impression material, but the material's flowing counterclockwise into this open sulcus. And this is what we need, lateral retraction of the tissue 
away from the tooth. You can't buy a super thin impression material and think you're gonna sneak it between the gingiva and the tooth. It doesn't work that way. You have to create space, and I'm gonna show you this in some pictures in just a second to make it a little more clear. But once you create that space, you can do anything you want and get a great impression. Now that reverse preparation technique only works if you're prepping a crown for the first time. If a crown has already been prepped, you can't use the depth cuts anymore, it becomes harder. So how do you know how much you've reduced? Well, Shine also sells these Prep Sure Crown Prep Guides from Direct to Dental. And you can see that they've got a one millimeter, a 1.5 and a two millimeter thickness. I'm begging them to come up with a 0.6 millimeter one, but you know what? We should be shooting for a millimeter anyway for our solid zirconia. You can see there's a mesial and a distal end to these. And so the mesial end goes in over the mesial marginal ridge. It checks the reduction there and on the mesial half of the occlusal surface. You can either set it on the tooth, have the patient bite together and confirm their other unprepared teeth are in maximum intercuspation, or you can just start from the buckle and slide it in between the opposing teeth and the buckle cusps, and then push it towards the lingual to make sure it'll slide through without the patient's teeth popping apart. The distal end, you can see it's got that little back action curve on it. And so we're checking that same tooth and the distal marginal ridge, because marginal ridges are a lot of times where teeth are underprepared. And so we're checking the distal half of the occlusal surface and the distal marginal ridge and the distal buccal and distal lingual cusps by moving it back and forth. With these, this is faster than bite registration. This is faster than wax and more accurate than either of those. This is the fastest way if you don't have a digital impression scanner where you can click two dots and see how much you reduce. This is the fastest way to check your reduction and the best way. One of my mentors, Dr. Bill Strupp, had to say this when it came to impressions for crown and bridge. In reality, a crown and bridge impression is merely a reflection of the dentist's integrity. Nothing more and nothing less. Ouch, that's a little harsh. I would actually say that 10 crown and bridge impressions are a much better way to judge because everybody's got difficult patients, difficult. I had a patient the other day, number 15, super fat, buckle fat pad. It was more like a buckle fat, queen size mattress, trying to get it out of the way, trying to get through these surfaces. You can't judge somebody on the toughest situations, but if you look at 10 different preps, odds are there's gonna be a good mix of easy, medium, and difficult in there. I think the impression's even more important than the prep. Because if you do something wrong in the prep, you underprepare, a uh, lab can make a reduction coping you for, for you, for example. But even with the world's best prep, if you fail to capture all of the margin in the impression, then that the lab's just guessing on part of that prep. So what's more important? I would say the impression, to be honest, because labs can work with bad preps, but bad impressions, there's no coming back from. They are just absolutely guessing. And the most predictable technique of all the gold standard is the two core technique that I just showed you. I mentioned Pascal. They've got knitted cords, braided cords, twisted cords. Their commitment to soft tissue management is kind of unbelievable. It's almost over the top, but it's very appreciated by somebody like myself who's passionate about this. Here's the hemostatic pellets with and without epi. These are amazing when you've got that one area that keeps bleeding to take one of these epi pellets and just cram it in there with force against the capillaries and it doesn't discolor like some tissue management styptic solutions will use. They've got a whole chart letting you know the difference between their knitted, braided, and twisted cords, which other cords in the market they compare to if you want to switch over and use them. Their commitment to being able to move tissue laterally away from teeth is, uh, is unbelievable. And they've got all kinds of educational information too. And look at what happens when you take a number two cord. Again, this is a um, knitted braided number two cord and we're lifting it out of the sulcus. Look at these red arrows there. That lateral retraction is what dental technicians crave. This is what they adore about the dentist that they love the most is that they get the tissue laterally away. It's not about getting it vertically away. You got to get laterally away. Look at this. You can see the double zero cord in the bottom still. You can also find your car keys if you happen to lose those the day before. This is like the size of a credit card space. And we're gonna go in and inject polyvinyl or do a digital impression. You can mix alginate in a bowl and flick it from the other side of the room and probably get it. In fact, you could probably just load a tray with impression material and seat it into the patient's mouth with no syringing and get a great impression because the tissue is temporarily away from the tooth because we left the cord in that top cord in for eight minutes, roughly, somewhere around eight to 10 minutes, while the patient bit down on that compra cap. It's enough time to go do a hygiene exam, and it's enough time to let that tissue stay away so that while the impression uh, material is setting up or you're doing a digital scan, the tissue will stay where it's supposed to stay. This is the secret to great impressions. Look at that. You can't miss this impression. It's unmissable. 
And it's just because you use this technique. Now the first chord, the double zero chord, super easy to put in. It's the second step of that verse preparation technique. If you hate packing chords, and don't let your assistant do this one and put the copper cap on, but don't not do it just because you don't like doing it. And I will show you an alternative to this, but this is the gold standard. If you look at this, you know you can't miss this impression. How could you miss it? It's literally unmissable with the tissue that far away from the tooth. And there's a shot from the top. I mean, it's, it's again, it's just setting yourself up for an ideal impression. And look at this from, here's the impression of the double zero chord down here on the bottom. So it's a nice thick edge instead of a thin little wispy fin on the edge of the impression. It's a big, thick impression. And look at all this unprepared tooth structure with the red arrow. So here's the end of the margin. This, and your technician knows exactly where it is. And here's unprepared tooth structure beyond that. So they can give you perfect or near perfect emergence profile on your crown. Mike, I hate cord. I don't want to pack cord. I, that's okay, whatever. That's a weird, weird thing to hate in restorative dentistry. It just, it is. Of all the things to hate, to hate retraction cord in the process that's going to give you the best chance of getting a good impression. But I understand, you know, Shine sells products from companies, Traxident, Exbacil, Dries Blue from Parkell. These are all really good at stopping bleeding. What they're not really good at is taking tissue and moving it laterally away from the tooth. That's kind of magical thinking to think that any of these putties and paste can do that in, as opposed to a material that takes a physical space like a retraction cord. So if you don't want to pack cord and you want to use these materials, do it in conjunction with a diode laser. And you can see a diode laser leaves some telltale signs. You can see like the little onion skinning as we call it around here as you go around here. But look at, we have that same lateral retraction of the tissue that we got with the cord. Okay, it's a little more, it's going to last longer here. It's going to last probably 48 to 72 hours because we did it with the diode laser. But regardless, we're getting that same amazing impression for our technician by creating this lateral trough around there. So whether you want to do it with the cord or a diode laser is up to you. I'm perfectly happy to do it with the diode laser on posterior teeth. I don't really like it for anterior teeth though because the tips of our diode lasers aren't thin enough where we can trough on an anterior tooth without losing some tissue height at the same time. And as part of that reverse preparation technique, we're trying to put our margin half a millimeter subgingival by putting that double zero cord in before we prep the margin. And if we use a diode laser, we're gonna be able to see where our, our tooth margin and our crown margin come together. We don't want patients seeing that in the anterior. So for me, to use a diode laser to recontour tissue on the anterior is fine, but for troughing, I'm only gonna use a diode in the for posterior teeth and everything's going to be two cord in the anterior usually a double zero with a two cord on top it could be a double zero with a one cord on top it's your pick it all depends on the sulcus and how much attached gingiva you have and again we've got a nice good thick impression without the use of cord because we used a diode laser my diode laser of choice is the denmat nv pro 3 which shine also happens to sell this is a great pen based one, as you can see, that's all there is. It's got a foot pedal that goes with it too. And it's one of the best designed foot pedals on the market because it has a, a top and sides on the foot pedal. So you can lift it with your foot and set it down somewhere else. If you're changing your angle, changing your like hip angle to the patient to be able to go and work on a different area. It's unlike a rheostat where you have to kick it and try to drag it around. You can pick it up with your foot and move it as you move your foot. And again, initiating the tips on these lasers simply done with a piece of articulating paper or a Sharpie just drawing on the tip itself. And you can see the initiated tip. That's where it's gonna cut, where that dark spot is, where we marked it. And again, this is just a, a nice way to be able to go in here, this is on a bicuspid, and be able to create that lateral retraction around the tooth. You can see that kind of onion skinning that we get when we use the diode. My assistant standing next to me with a wet two by two, and I just lift up the laser and give it to her and she can pull those pieces of tissue off the end of that. So again, you can see we're getting that same lateral retraction of the tissue away without having to use a cord. I don't know how you can practice without a diode laser, to be honest. There's just so many times where it's so necessary to go in and remove some tissue and not have an electrosurge or a, a scalpel. And it works really well for crown and bridge procedures um, like this as well. But again, not on anterior teeth because you can see because the tips, the thinnest tips we have for these diode lasers are 400 microns wide. If we had a 100 micron tip, we could go in your trough and not lose vertical tissue height. 
But here it's not as important on a bicuspid as it is on an anterior tooth if we can see where the crown and the tooth come together. We definitely want to hide that on anterior teeth. Specifically, I mean 6 through 11 or 7 through 10 when it comes to not using a diode laser to a trough. But on molars and bicuspids, I have no problem at all. So I want to wrap this up by saying we can all become masters. We can all become better. I, I've proved it with my own below average set of hands. We can all get above average results, but it's a combination. It's not just hands, it's not just eyes, and it's not just brain. There, I've learned over 33 years that there's one other thing and it's heart. You know, your heart has to be in it. You have to care, really care about doing the best you can for your patients and being willing to be very honest and ask your laboratory technician, please give me honest critical feedback about what I'm doing and what I could do better. And you might have to ask them that a couple of times because you're sending them checks every month after all, and they're not in the habit of critiquing people who send them money because they don't want you to get offended and move somewhere else. If you really wanna accelerate your growth, getting involved uh, with digital intraoral scanning is absolutely the fastest way to do that. I'd love for you to do me the favor of just trying that technique once, you know, trying the depth cutters, try the round burr for prepping the margin and see if it's not the easiest thing you've done. Try putting in that double zero cord as the second step of that procedure and then the number two cord on top of it or invest in a diode laser if you like that approach better. But none of this is difficult. None of this takes a high degree of skill. It, it just doesn't. I mean, because I'm able to do it. And that's why I, can't, I had to come up with that technique because I wasn't going to wake up the next day with a ton of dexterity in my hands. I had to find another way to get there. It's kind of like, instead of being artistic, I'm doing like prep by numbers, kind of like paint by numbers if you were a kid and you couldn't paint as well as the kid next to you. And I'm not insulting myself or you with that. The reality is there's just a variety of skills of dentists. We should all be getting above average results. And I think if you try this prep and impression technique, you're going to find that you're going to be able to get the same kind of above average results. If you have any questions for me, there's my email address, mcdetola at mac.com. I'd love to interact with you and help any way that I can. So on behalf of everybody at KVO, Henry Shine, and myself, I want to thank you for your time and your continued commitment to quality dentistry. Thank you so much, Dr. Detola, for really bringing the energy and passion and for a very informational presentation. And of course, thanks to all of you for attending. I certainly hope everyone enjoyed tonight's webinar as I did. We would certainly appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on your screen shortly. We did record tonight's webinar, so we'll email the recording out via email sometime in the next week. Once again, thanks for attending and have a great night.